I think it could be said without the fear of contradiction that the most horrifying, satanic, demonic, devilish time the world maybe has ever known was experienced during the Holocaust. When Nazi Germany set out to exterminate through genocide an entire race instigated by the devil, the Jewish people. They slaughtered six million of them. Over a million of them were little children, little boys, little girls, innocent. And thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands upon tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands upon hundreds of thousands were marched to their deaths. Oddly enough, at times, at Treblinka, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau, when they would march out to the gas chambers, not knowing whether, where they were going, the German guards would throw flowers at them. And the strains of the Strauss waltzes would play. It's music so beautiful and so haunting. A strange, bizarre spectacle. They would not know when they smelled the roses and heard the strains of the music that they were going to their deaths, but they were. Tonight, millions upon millions of human beings, the number is staggering. It's so staggering that at times the weight, the burden of it overwhelms one. This afternoon praying, it seemed like it was like a crushing weight that gripped me when I realized that millions, millions, hundreds of millions walk into the maw of hell. They smell the roses. They see the flowers and they hear the music, not knowing they're going to their deaths, eternal deaths. John the Revelator used strange terminology in the 16th chapter of the book that God the Holy Ghost gave unto him. Those three terms were out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The dragon, of course, is Satan. The beast will be the Antichrist, and his spirit is with us even today. And the false prophet is false apostate religion that will characterize the rise of the Antichrist. I want to come from that which John gave so long ago, even though it pertains to days yet to come. The spirit of all of this is tremendously alive even today. It's an ironical thing. As I preach this message, and it will have happened sometimes in the past as you see it by television, the news media is extolling with millions upon millions of dollars worth of free airtime, speaking in glowing, virtuous praise of the rock music scene in America today. Speaking of, they put it, the greatest concert in the history of music, of rock music, that will reach over one billion people. Out of the mouth of the dragon. Rock stars after rock stars are paraded across the screen, held up as models of compassion, integrity, love, 
You look at it and you, it's, it's like, it's like the roses are being thrown and the music is playing and the millions are marching to their death. It's like up is down, down is up, in is out, out is in, black is white, white is black. When in reality, these individuals are the tools in the hands of Satan to steal and to kill and to destroy in an unprecedented fashion in this land and the world today as it has never known before. I want to say that again because it's important. The rock music scene in America today is not just a fad. It is a diabolical scheme of Satan. to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it has gathered into its maw the children, the boys, the girls, the teenagers, the young adults by the millions upon a life of drugs, of Satan worship, of illicit sex, of the powers of darkness uh, that has mutilated, decimated, damned, denigrated, degraded, and destroyed. And yet, the elite do not see it or understand it. Sponsoring this huge extravaganza will be some of the mightiest corporations in the United States of America. held up to the American public as that which is good and noble, when in reality it is dirty, degradating, filthy, and rotten. I had a young man to walk into back to the platform just before the service was to begin in a particular American city, large city. He introduced himself and he said, Brother Swaggart, I was in the rock music scene. I, I was a part of it for years. He said, I will never forget the last one that I attended. I didn't know God. I did not, did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I, I was a musician, I was a singer. This particular night I was there with crowd control and I had my little boy with me. And he said, I will never forget what transpired. It all seemed to come to a head. He said that Colosseum was packed to capacity with tens of thousands of people. Before the so-called concert even started, he said the air was heavily laden with marijuana smoke and it was so thick you would even get high walking through it. He said, I watched them taking out young men and young ladies that were overcome by drugs and I was helping them do it. He said, I watched one girl go out of her mind and her little boy was there and he was, he was almost in a state of panic, not knowing what was wrong with his mother, and her mind was gone on drugs, and they were trying to take her out. He said, I've often thought of that child. He said, I saw them waiting there, the thousands of thousands, and I had been in concert after concert, had participated in them, and I wondered, as it all seemed to come to a head and something started telling me deep down inside, this is death. It is death. Death. He said, I went backstage and he said, in room after room, I, I would open the door and I would see men and women in stages of undress. I would see them engaging in, in adultery. And, and the scene was, was straight out of Danny's Inferno. It was like animals. It was like 
dogs that were cohabiting in public. And he said something inside of me was revulsed. I, I had him take my little boy back because, I, of course, I couldn't have him see this. He said, a few days later, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. In one particular magazine, the story was told of one particular rock group that I will leave nameless because they're not worth naming. And it's a story so obscene and depraved that you'll have to soften it up to even tell it. This group and others like them are the heroes of the nation's children. They are heard daily by millions of kids as they tune in and turn on to the local rock music station. This particular group of which I mention is noted for its perverted sex themes and actions on stage and off. Hit Parader, August 1984, carried a lead article about the group in which this particular man described some of the band's sexual escapades. He said the other day we had this one chick in the van and she was hanging over the seat naked and what follows is a description in detail of varieties of sex acts performed by the girl on band members and vice versa. Language and depictions too obscene and graphic to include. The story was sent to one particular organization by a parent who found her 13-year-old son reading the magazine. This magazine, I want to tell you something. Hit Parader is a rock magazine that can be bought by children of all ages at places like Walmart, Kmart, the grocery store, and practically any other retail store that sells magazines. The smut business has moved out of the back alleys and the adult bookstores into your family convenience stores. Like 7-Eleven. The magazines are sold right alongside Field and Stream. Included in the same article is the philosophy of the band. Members attribute their success to singing about what the kids want to hear. And the really weird thing about all of this is that millions of dollars will be handed over to children by parrots in order for the kids to go hear these preachers of perversion masquerading as musicians telling the kids that your parrots or anyone else who tells you what to do is the devil and you ought to shout right back at them and it doesn't make a lot of sense. The other side of the story involves young minds influenced and corrupted by these rock groups. And this story comes from Esquire magazine. One columnist was traveling through San Antonio, Texas, listening to a radio program. And on the station was a local disc jockey promoting a local rock group concert, a rock concert. And the promotion involved a write-in contest and the listeners were to respond in writing to the question, what would you do to meet this group? Fan, fans sending in best responses would be treated to free tickets to the concert. And some of the winners would get to go backstage and meet this perverted bunch. The man called the station and asked to see the entries. Each had responded by describing what they would do in order to meet the members of this band. And all entries involved depictions of sex, often the perverted variety. These are some of the milder responses, including this one by a 13-year-old girl. She said, I would give my body to this group until it was black and blue. One 16-year-old girl described in graphic detail 
sadomasochistic sexual techniques involving leathers, razors, and spiked heels. And the girl's mother was asked by the columnist what she thought of the letter. She said, yes, I read the letter. I, was, I took it down to the radio station for her. I guess I was shocked, but I'm sure she didn't mean anything by it. She's a very good Christian girl. One 15-year-old said she would get on her hands and knees, and I can't repeat what else she said. She said, I mean it. I'd get down on my hands and knees. I'd give them anything they wanted. I know they're grown men, and I'm only 15, but so what? It would be worth it to meet them. She said, they're like God. They're even better than God. The rest of the story is, if you think that's bad, it's too perverted and depraved to say any more about it. It's a story that is repeated night after night all across America as millions of kids are pulled into the world of sexual perversions, of anarchy and drugs. And it's all a very clever marketing strategy aimed at building, sustaining, and exploiting pruance among our nation's youth. And it's met with a great yawning silence by the public and the pulpits. God help us. But let me go further. This voice of the dragon, that's what it is, has become so dirty, so damnable, so depraved as it involves itself in so many, so much drugs, illicit sex, and even demon worship, involving sex with dead bodies, bestiality, sex with animals. Think of what I'm saying. That somehow the public has started to sense something's wrong here. But the devil is very clever. He's changing his tactics today. And I want you to hear me carefully. Satan always goes too far in his, in his greed to steal and to kill and to destroy. He gets too perverted, too damnable, too dastardly. So he changes course, and then millions fall for it all over again. And today it's called, listen carefully, Christian rock music. <laughs> Under the guise of reaching teenagers for the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, it's more perverted than ever when it pulls God into its perversion. We will dress like the rock groups. We will set up our stage like the rock groups with the rolling lights and the smoke bombs. It'll look just like a stage performance by the rock bands that I could have named tonight and didn't. We'll write our songs and play our music in a way that it will be difficult to tell the difference. And we will do it all under the name of God. Mark my word today, when you tamper with the Holy of Holies, when you tamper with the Holy of Holies, you're tampering with God. You're going to see rank blasphemy in the near future if you don't already see it in so-called Christian circles. Listen to this song. It was written over 200 years ago. When I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyelids close in death, when I soar through tracks unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. To play thee. Now roll these words around on your tongue. One of the latest so-called Christian rock 
offerings. But we've never felt better. Straight for the sky, baby, do it or die. Never better, and it's okay to be this way because rock and roll is here to stay. Oh, no, 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 this is Christian. Jesus met the devil in the desert winds did blow. He said, if you be the son of God, take a rock and make him roll. That's blasphemy, ladies and gentlemen. I'll never stop playing that rock and roll. I've got a message that must be told. He's the rock and he makes me roll. I don't care if I ever make the radio. That's blasphemy. So-called Christian radio stations are blasting out contemporary Christian music that is indistinguishable from whirly rock. The voice of the dragon. Hard rock addicts who tune in accidentally have been known to call in and request particular rock recordings and they are surprised when they are told it's a Christian station. I sat at the table the other day with two Baptist brethren and you listen to me what I'm about to tell you. I had to bow my head in shame. My heart ached and hurt when I had to admit the, to those two Baptist brethren that not all, thank God, but most, most of the so-called Christian rock musicians come from Pentecostal ranks. That makes it even worse. I realize that some of you will sit here tonight and some of you but television and say, I, I don't care what you say, I like it. I cannot help what you like. It's wrong. It's of the devil. It's of the powers of darkness. It's not of God. You're not looking at a novice. You're not listening at someone that read, has read something in a magazine somewhere. My family started rock and roll. I don't say that with any glee. I don't say it with any pomp or pride. I say it with shame and sadness because I've seen the death and the destruction. I've seen the unmitigated misery and the pain. I've seen it. Steal, kill, destroy. When I stand on a, behind a pulpit and I speak of these words, I speak of experience. My family, Jerry Lee Lewis with Elvis Presley with Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis is my cousin, started rock and roll. A neighbor, somebody said the other, me, the other day to me, you don't care about our young people. The problem is I care too much. It's the voice of the dragon under the guise of Christianity. It produces no better results within the church than it does within the world. I turned on the television the other day and a so-called Christian program was on the air. Contemporary music was rolling in the background, sounding like a cross between Islam music, Muslim music, and weird Eastern culture offerings uh, purported to be Christians in a Pentecostal church uh, with girls dancing to the music. No, not even purporting to dance in the spirit, but dancing to the music with skirts flying, offering it over television. Mark my word. Listen to me, you are about to experience today the most dangerous era the church has ever known. Hear what I'm about to tell you. My heart breaks for the laity. My heart breaks for you that drive nails for a living, that are lawyers for a living, that are engineers or pilots or wash dishes or cooks or wherever. My heart breaks because you're about to enter the most dangerous time the church of the living God has ever witnessed or experienced. Why do you say that, preacher? Why do you say that? Last night I mentioned the churches. Last night I mentioned the churches. I'll mention something else. Satan is going to use and is using so-called Christian television today, so-called Christian television to lead astray and to deceive millions. And if you're not close to God and you don't know this book, you will be deceived by the voice of the dragon. <laughs> Satan.
Satan has always tried to subvert the church by intruding the world into it. And I wonder if he hasn't succeeded more than we realize with blind men posing as believers. In the Christian world today, the heroes are the athletes. Movie actors, actresses, entertainers that are held up as role models for our youth. No wonder they're going to hell in a handbasket. Are you listening to me? Maybe I sound caustic, but I ache, I hurt. I look as my master looked 2,000 years ago at Jerusalem, and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and he wept because they were a sheep that had no shepherd. I look with wide open eyes at one so-called Pentecostal telecast states we are going to build a Christian nightclub. The lights will roll. The music will blast contemporary rock. We ought to have it too. That is the voice of the dragon. Another gospel, another gospel. You're going to have to know your Bibles. You're going to have to know your God. You're going to have to have a touch of God in your heart if you're going to make it in this age in which we live. Because Satan, under the guise of Christianity, under the guise of the Word of God, under the guise of the Holy Spirit, you hear what I'm telling you? Under the guise even of the gifts of the Spirit is going to be the voice of the dragon leading men astray by the millions. And unless you're on fire for God, and unless you know your Bible, and unless you're full of the Holy Ghost, you will fall for it and be led astray. <laughs> Out of the mouth of the dragon, Satan. And then he said, Out of the mouth of the beast. The day, the usurper, the deceiver, Satan has his employees, evil men, seducers, waxing worse and worse, deceiving, if possible, even the very elect. And he's very adept, Satan is, at covering, subverting, hiding. He says the opposite of what he is. I'll change the subject completely. Listen carefully. You ride through the cities. I was praying yesterday afternoon, walked down a particular street, saw the sign in front of a house, Planned Parenthood. One of the most ungodly, tax-supported citadels of evil in this nation today. The voice of the beast, a man. William F. Jasper wrote this in the review of the news. He said, Planned Parenthood took out a full page advertisement in the Los Angeles Times and other major newspapers in May of 1985. The title of their Ad was nine reasons why abortions are legal. But unfortunately, for Planned Parenthood, on the same morning that its nine reasons ad appeared, millions of people in Planned Parenthood's intended audience saw with their own eyes seven reasons why abortion should be illegal. And I'll tell you what they saw. Sex tepulates. Sex tepulates were delivered. One stillborn at a hospital in Orange, California. Seven little babies. You saw it on your television cameras. You watched the six surviving tiny little infants struggling for life. Premature premies. And lo and behold, they were not 
fetal tissue or uterine content. They were living human beings struggling to live. Are you listening to me, America? Are you hearing me, doctors? Are you hearing me, nurses? Are you hearing me, the Supreme Court? Are you hearing me, Congress? Are you hearing me, Senate? These little, tiny, premature infants, weighing less than two pounds each, you could hold each one of them in the palm of your hand, were unmistakably real, live human babies. Little children, actual people, not garbage. They would have been neither more or less human if they had been able to spend the full nine months in their mother's womb. Yet babies more fully developed than these are killed regularly by planned parenthood abortionists. One noted scientist in California told me, he said, you shouldn't use that word kill or murder. It's too strong. It's too value laden. What's wrong with America? When you pick up a magazine in Arizona and it's on the front page that some insect has suddenly ceased to exist and they're all upset over it. But a baby is nothing. What's wrong in California when I see over the news that a buzzard is about to become extinct and they're all excited over it, hurt? A buzzard. Planned Parenthood said there is an argument these days that a fetus is a person. It's just an argument, you see, dismissed in the ad as a matter of opinion. Let me tell you about this Planned Parenthood. From its beginning, some 68 years ago, it championed abortion on demand. But taking care lest it outrage the nation, it muted or misrepresented its radical position on the issues. In 1963, when abortion was both a crime and a public outrage, Planned Parenthood was promoting the fiction that comprehensive sex education in the schools would eliminate teen pregnancy and demand for abortion. But as soon as that hook was swallowed, Planned Parenthood jumped into the sex education programs to promote both abortion services and sexual attitudes, which would invite the ever higher abortion rates that we see today. Listen. The slogan of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, every child a wanted child, and you can hear the implications in that one. And a headline saying, and this is, you can see the trail of the serpent in this one, make America friendlier to children. This is the hypocrisy and class exploitation of this group. Try to imagine any place on earth less friendly than an abortion clinic. <laughs> Yet Planned Parenthood performed some 83,000 abortions last year, making it the leading practitioner of that ultimate in child abuse. One of its leaders said in a 1968 Planned Parenthood newsletter, we are still able to put babies in the class of dangerous epidemics, even though this is the exact truth. One particular doctor said in that same outfit, pregnancy may be defined as an illness treated by an evacuation of the uterine contents. Another of its founders said the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. This woman was a virulent racist 
She asserted that 70% of America's population was feeble-minded and a menace to the race. She said they're mere human weeds and human waste. And 47% of the population was morons, she said. Together with the blind, the deaf, the crippled, the poor, and other biologically tainted stock, we ought to sterilize them or get rid of them. She saw the African Negro as a subhuman. She said the Slav is a subhuman, the Latin is a subhuman, and the Jew is a subhuman. That from Planned Parenthood. And it's supported by our tax dollars. You listen to me. When Planned Parenthood began its programs in Hawaii in 1970, the next seven years saw the incidence of prenuptial pregnancies and of venereal infections triple. The other day, teaching contraception to junior high school students in one particular county in one state, the school system officially approved at a recent board meeting, a program to successfully instruct co-ed classes in contraception. You see, these people promote sex education, the voice of the beast in our public schools, stating that it will prevent premarital pregnancy and cut down on venereal disease and even decrease the number of divorces. Let me tell you something tonight. It'll sound old-fashioned. Many of you have never heard it in all of your life, but this Bible is the best sexual educational design known to man. I'm going to say something that you need to hear. Sex before marriage is wrong in any shape form of fashion. It's wrong. You're inviting disaster. You're inviting trouble. You're inviting heartache, young lady, in a proportion that you would have never dreamed imaginable. When God said, thou shalt not, he was not withholding pleasure from you. He made you in a certain way. And those beasts, and that's what they are, beast when they dangle this in front of little children in classrooms bereft of morality because in american schools today you can't dare mention jesus christ or the bible <laughs> let me tell you parrot something if you have to do without a new suit, mister, if you have to do without a new dress, lady, if you have to wear the same pair of shoes over and over again, get your boy and your girl into a Christian school somewhere where they can be taught the Word of God and have education based on the Word of Almighty God. What has happened in countries where compulsory sex education has enlightened and liberalized the, the young people. Liberalized. I want you to listen. What has happened in these countries? In the seven years that followed the adoption of compulsory sex education in Denmark in 1970, listen, assaults and rapes rose by 300% and venereal disease increased in those individuals over 20 years of age by 200%. Among those between the ages of 16 and 20, it rose by 250%. And in those 15 years of age and younger, there was a 400% increase in assaults and rapes after compulsory sex education was introduced in Denmark. It was introduced in Sweden as far back as 1954. And today that nation has the highest BD rate in Europe and in the world. Between 1968 and 1974 in Sweden, venereal disease in mothers under 14 years of age increased 900%.
Between 1972 and 1974, rape increased 400%. And in Sweden, the situation has gotten out of hand so bad that a group of doctors is petitioning the king to abolish compulsory sex education in the Swedish school system. It's considered to be too destructive to family life and the moral stability of young people. One man said the other day, those who are concerned with the problems of public school sex education are too often dismissed as neurotic prudes, religious fanatics, and right-wing nuts. While the purveyors of the bizarre ideas and materials are regarded as enlightened educators whose advice should be pursued. Listen, you don't promote sex among young people unless you have ulterior motives for wanting young people to experiment with sex. I want to say something else. It seems like no one else will say it. But these people from your own world-renowned university here in Connecticut called Yale, throw in Harvard, throw in Princeton, and above all, throw in Columbia and New York City. They have filled our nation with a lie, the voice of the beast that is stealing and killing and destroying and damning an entire nation of young people. It only takes 20 years to destroy a country. If you destroy one generation, you have destroyed the fabric of that nation. I do not have the vocabulary to stand here and tell you how idiotic these airheads really are. They ought to give doctorates for stupidity. They ought to give doctorates for idiocy. They ought to give doctorates uh, for the most gross ignorance. They have closed this Bible, ripped the Ten Commandments from our school walls, uh, and denied the name of Jesus to be mentioned except in historical form. And mister, you are destroying. Lady, you are destroying. Supreme Court, you may set in your smug satisfaction with your robes pulled up about your aged, frail shoulders. But soon, you are going to stand before the God of the ages, and the blood of an entire nation is going to be on your hands. The news media, those men that sat in their ivory towers over CBS, NBC, ABC, and of lesser extent in thousands of stations across this nation. That consider themselves to be little gods. These individuals, these voices of the beast, when I asked the other day, well, aren't you responsible? I'm talking about journalists. I'm talking about the news media. I'm talking about those that, that come into your homes, that come into your houses, that come into your bedrooms and your living rooms every single day of the year, reporting to you what is happening in this nation and the world. I'm going to show you something tonight that hopefully will open your eyes a little bit. The news media, those that are in those positions, 
They say that 90% of them say that the woman has the right to, dis to decide on abortion. Only 15% of the news media agree that adultery is wrong. I've had more dealings with the news media than maybe most of you have. And I don't mean the lower echelons, I mean the highest, the mightiest, the most powerful in the land and the world. There is a reason that the news media does what it does. One of them asked the other day, well, isn't it your business to just report the news and to guarantee that your source is accurate? And the answer was, that is not our business at all. We are literally unconcerned about the source, whether it's accurate or not. Our business is to mold public thinking. I'm going to tell you this and listen to me. Our government, our elected president, the Congress, the Senate, does not govern the United States of America anymore. Listen carefully to me. Every decision they make is governed by the news media's ability to twist and turn the American public by telling you what they want you to hear. I want that to sink in. The news media of CBS, NBC, ABC, they're the ones that's governing this nation. They are sacrosanct, untouchable, unlimited amounts of money. No one has ever been able to topple one of them. They literally govern this nation by going into the homes of every single solitary American, telling you what you ought to think. One man from Afghanistan, where those poor Afghanistanians are dying by the thousands under the most horrifying Russian bloodletting that the world has ever known, was in America just the other day trying to get an audience on the media, trying to tell the American public what's going on there, and the media said, we're not interested. You notice the media never uses the word communist. Never. The media today in America, the news media, what you read in your newspapers, what you see over television, what you read in the magazines is anti-God and anti-American. They wouldn't care about me saying anti-God. They're totally unconcerned about that because most of them are atheist or agnostic. They would bristle at anti-American, but I want to remind you if you're half asleep and you accidentally turned on this preacher. The American way, sir, is still in God we trust. And the words of this Bible that you hold in sarcasm and ridicule, the American way is still the old stars and stripes that still beckons to the world. There is freedom in this land of the brave and the home of the free. One nation under God, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all.
the most favorite song in the United States of America, even though you won't recognize it, Mr. Newsman, is still the old rugged cross on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and of shame. In this United States, the greatest name in this country is not some fleshly rock star or some movie matinee idol, but the greatest name is still the Lord Jesus Christ in this land of the brave and the home of the free. I want to say something else while I'm at it. I have no, no regard for your ilk. None at all. Your hypocrisy, your sham, if this nation ever falls, you can lay much of it to the, to, at the doorsteps of the news media in the United States of America. I know you hate God. You have no regard for church. You have no regard for the Bible. I know you. I've dealt with too many of you. You're low life. You have the morals of a skunk. I know it's the truth. You've attended the universities and they've given you your degrees and you've sat under that liberation theology and that socialist, secular, humanistic, dialectical, materialistic thinking. I know you. I know where you came from. I know who you are. Down in your heart, you wouldn't be too upset if the United States went socialist to communist and we lost every freedom we had. And you, as the elite that knows and understands all things, governed this nation because you know, don't you? No, you don't know. You're blind and poor and naked. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was in the Soviet Union. He was extolled by the news media here in the United States as someone that had knowledge and knew. But when you found out that he's a champion of freedom and of the Bible and of God, today he's a para and you have no truck with him, no regard for him. Last. No, devil, I'm not through. <laughs> not only out of the mouth of the dragon, not only out of the mouth of the beast, but out of the mouth of the false prophet. Do you know tonight where the most dangerous place that most of you Christians can be is? I'll ask the question again. Listen to me by television. The voice of the false prophet, do you know where the most dangerous place that you as a Christian can be? Where? The dance hall, the discotheque, the rock show, the beer hall. Where, where, where? No, no, no. The church. Does that sound strange? No, not all churches. No, not all churches. No, not all churches. But most churches in this land no longer preach this book, no longer preach the Bible, no longer believe in a God that's in heaven, no longer believe in his son, Jesus Christ, no longer believe he was born of the Virgin Mary, no longer believe Jesus died for man and rose from the dead on the third day and sits at the right hand of God today and is coming back again. No longer believes it. From behind pulpit after pulpit, we have Christian humanism. These sugar-coated, syrupy purveyors of apostasy tell us these blind leaders of the blind, oh, 
know we can teach evolution and creationism at the same time because evolution is a part of creationism. We believe there is a God and he made man. He made him a little, a little amoeba that came out of some squirrely ooze. I enjoy sometimes watching these apostates squirm when they're asked, do you believe Jesus is the son of God? Oh, he is a great teacher. Jesus called you blind, leading the blind. He called you outside whited sulfurs, but inside full of dead men's bones, liars and hypocrites, snakes, leading men to perdition. <laughs> Voice of the false prophet. It makes me sick to my stomach. It's some Pentecostal preachers that's supposed to be baptized in the Holy Ghost telling their people to come up with syrupy words. Come on up because you have a psychological difficulty. You need psychological rehabilitation. That's disgusting. That stinks in God's nostrils. You ought to pull off your collar, take off your coat, slink out of the back of the church, and send in your resignation. <laughs> out of the mouth of the false prophet. Another preacher and myself sat in a little small frame house in a southern city. It was plain, simple. It had three rooms to it, a kitchen, a little living room, a little bedroom. There was only a little, little linoleum rug on the floor, a little cheap imitation, vinyl couch, a little small gas burner in the kitchen, no cabinet, a table, some straight back chairs. I sat there and looked at it. It was as clean as a pen. The picture hung on the wall. A lady sat there, a young lady, a young woman with a little two-year-old boy. Two hours before, she had taken a glass, a jar, a bottle full of pills, emptied it in her hands, and started to take them. It's bad when you come to that. You think of what I'm telling you. In last year, 16,000, well, let me take that back. Every day, 16,000 teenagers attempt to take their lives. 16 of them succeed every day in America. I won't tell you the miracle how that God stopped her. I'll mention it briefly. Sitting there with that, her little boy by her side, two years old, innocent, looking at mommy. She didn't know who his father was. Handful of pills, crying, lonely, heartbroken. Nobody cares. When the devil gets through with you, he throws you away. She flicked on the radio. She just absent-mindedly turned the knob. And this poor, frail preacher that stands before you tonight was just coming on the air with a radio program, The Camp Meeting Guy, and the song was coming over. Someone to care, someone to share. Every trouble that you have to go through. And it hit her. God told her, I love you. 
She picked up through blinding tears, the yellow pages, the phone book, didn't know any preacher, looked at the names, found churches, looked at the name and just called one. And I hadn't been in that city two times in my life, and I haven't been back since except for a crusade. But I was there, and I was in the preacher's home when she dialed the phone and dialed the number and said, I, I'm listening to a preacher over television, over radio, and I'm about to take my life. God, don't you tell me he's not trying to pull you home. I'll make it brief. I sat there and looked at her. She wept. The pastor was with me. She said, I lived as bad as a human being could live. I don't know who the father of my baby is. I, 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 I was on drugs for years, perversion, filth, rot, illicit sex in every way you could describe, the dirtiest, the, the most deranged and denigrating. She said, now I want a home, I want life, I want something that's lovely, I, I, I want my child to, to have a decent upbringing and I have nothing to offer him. What will I tell him when he asks me, mommy, who is my daddy? And I don't know. And I thought to end my life. I tried to plead with her, but to no avail. She said, I'm too bad. I'm too dirty. I'm too evil. I'm too stained. Maybe others, but he couldn't save me. The pastor was talking to her, and I was pleading because I knew we were losing it. I saw a soul going into eternity, and I knew if we walked out that door, she would die without God. And I was crying, God, our back's to the wall. It's the last inning. The bell has rung, and there's no more time. Tell me what to say to her. And the Holy Ghost came. <laughs> Glory to God. He said, tell her this. I laid my hand on the pastor's shoulder. I said, wait a moment. I said, look at me. And she turned and her eyes were lowered. She still would look. And I took my hand, put it under her chin, if I remember. And I said, look at me. And finally she did. I said, young lady, God said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. And I saw her break and the tears. And she slumped down beside the little straight back chair. And in a few moments' time, the past so sordid had been washed away. And a name had been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Come, ye sinners, lost and hopeless. Jesus' blood can make you free. For he saved the worst among you when he saved a wretch like me. Bow your heads, please. Bow your heads. Oh, Jesus, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. It's growing late, America. It's very late. Do you hear me? Sun is setting the long fingers of twilight, groping over a planet that's forgotten God days without number. The voice of the dragon and of the beast and of the false prophet are beginning to be heard in the land. The storm is coming, and are you on board the ark? 
Listen carefully. God is speaking to you. He's telling you to hurry. You've been sensing it for days, maybe weeks, maybe months. You know it's time. Way down deep inside, the beer no longer satisfies. The dirty jokes no longer bring a laugh. The, the, the dialances no longer bring the thrill they once did. Something is wrong. The drugs no longer give a high. The rejection and the running has played its course. And everywhere you turn, he's saying, hurry, come home. How many in this Colosseum, how many by television, by the millions, would slip up a hand, pray for me, I want to come home. I will not embarrass you, Jimmy Swaggart, I'm not living right, please pray for me. Let me see that hand. The devil throws his roses. The Strauss waltzes are playing and you're going to your doom. Slip up the hand. On the main floor, quick, pray for me. I'm lost, I need God. Pray for me. Thank you. Up in the bleachers, all the way from the bottom to the top, my right hand side. How many will raise that hand? Husband, wife, son, daughter, mother, dad, grandfather, grandmother. Slip up that hand, I see them. Keep raising them, pray for me. I need God. Keep praying. I need God, preacher. Keep slipping up those hands. Thank you. Way in the back, as far as we can see back there, God sees it. Raise that hand, please. Thank you. Left hand side, the bleachers. How many will raise your hands? Slip up your hands. Thank you so much. I want everyone in this building to stand, please. Everybody standing. And God, thank you and bless you for your good manners and your kindness and your prayers. We're going to open the door. And I know there are thousands of godly people in this Coliseum in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm going to ask you to believe God with me right now, with love and compassion, to bring them home, to bring them in. Hurry, the storm is coming, the door is open. Come to the shelter. As they sing it right this very moment, I want you to come, mother, bring your unsaved son, dad, bring your unsaved daughter, children, bring your unsaved parents, bring your unsaved friends. Bring them on down these aisles. Come on right now as they sing it. <laughs> 